Good morning, everyone. Good morning and welcome on this Labor Day weekend. Welcome as we gather together in this different way that increasingly is feeling more normal to all of us. It is good to be together. And on this morning, we have the, the joy of welcoming back ministerial intern Ann Kadlicek. I'd like to welcome Liz Avalos as our chalice lighter for musical contributions, Bill Groth and Tanya Lehman. And we have a special musical guest today in Jeff Kaufman. So glad to welcome him. We always thank Tammy for her creative contribution and Jesse Edwards for his technical expertise and always his patience. I'd like to also offer a special welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Danbury, who is joining us this morning, and your minister, Reverend Heather Ryan Starr. Welcome all from Danbury. We're so happy to help have you in our virtual pews this morning. And so we begin with centering. These days are rough increasingly, and so we take a moment now to get our hearts and minds in the room and centered. And so we will do so this morning with words from Reverend Julia Hamilton. Julia serves our congregation and Santa Barbara. This is a poem that she wrote entitled, A Prayer for the Post Office. And again, this Labor Day weekend, this is particularly poignant. And so let us begin. This is a prayer for the quiet dignity of the blue mailbox standing like a sentinel on the corner, portal to anywhere for just the cost of a stamp. Do you remember the wonder of it? Dropping a letter in one place, mouth of the box swinging open and shut, eating the envelope like Cookie Monster only to have that same letter reappear days later in another place. It is a mundane miracle. Neither snow nor rain nor heat nor gloom of night stays these couriers from the swift completion of their appointed rounds. This is a prayer for the carriers on their routes, the clerk at the window, the back room sorters, and the delivery truck drivers moving mountains one piece at a time, passing along that which was entrusted to them. Electric bills, bank statements, birthday cards, ballots. Hear us, God of the taken for granted things, divine mystery of overnight delivery, spirit of civic life, May we preserve this minor magic of letter and stamp, scale and package, sorting machine and post box, so that our children do not shake their heads and wonder at all of the things we allowed to slip away. Amen. And welcome to all souls, where all souls are welcome. You are joyfully called this day to worship. We will begin by joining our voices in the beautiful hymn, Hush, and Tanya Lehman, our music director, will lead us. Thank you, Tanya. <laughs> Oh, my Lord, oh, my Lord, what shall I do? Hush. 
Someone is calling our names. And this morning and in this moment, I have the joy of calling Liz Avalos's name. As you know, we typically have a child or youth light our chalice and we're doing something a little different every once in a while we've decided and that is to invite one of All Souls elders. And Liz, one of our, our great participants in Elder Journey is doing the honors this morning. And so Liz will lead us in the chalice lighting that you will see on the slide before you. We will speak together the words of Cesar Chavez. Liz, welcome. Thank you. Perhaps we can bring the day when children will learn from their earliest days that being fully human means to give one's life to the liberation of all who suffer. Si se puede. and our candle of gratitude. In this harvest season, we give thanks for farm workers, 
migrant workers, those who plant and pick so that all may be nourished. We give thanks for those who load and then drive the trucks that transport food far and wide. We give thanks to our local farmers, those whose work better sustains the earth and strengthens our communities. For the work of these and all essential workers, we give thanks. Liz, thank you so much for being with us this morning. Thank you. Our reading this morning is called Do What You Do, Love What You Love by the poet Camille Rankin. Once, when I acknowledged to another poet that, if given the opportunity, through lottery winnings, discovery of buried treasure, money tree, or similar, I probably wouldn't work at all. She said, you see, you're buying into the idea that poetry isn't work, which isn't quite what I meant. Yes, of course I'd still write poetry, but I still wouldn't be getting paid for it. Not in any real way. Not in a way that would sufficiently cover my electricity bill or supply me with the monthly sacrifice demanded by the monster of my student loans. Because, as we all know, poetry doesn't pay that way. I wondered at the way this poet chafed at the idea that poetry could be considered something other than work. I think work is something we, as Americans, are a little in love with. I've been working at some job or another since I was 15. There is value in that work. The kind of work you work hard at, not because you love it, but because you have to. And for some of us, you want to do it well. But that kind of work isn't what defines me. It's so often your work is understood as who you are, as the most valuable thing you have to offer society. Being a poet, I feel as if I have two jobs, the one that feeds my bank account and the one that feeds all those intangible parts of me. So ends the reading. Thank you, Anne. We are in downtown Los Angeles, riding down the escalator in a big, blocky, modern building, the kind that scoffs at exterior walls and instead has glass from top to bottom. Those of us on the inside can see out, but no one on the outside can see in. And so on the inside, this is what I see. Many people moving about with great purpose and intention. Actually, it feels more like New York City than Los Angeles, which is weird. As we're riding down that escalator, surrounded by purpose, light streaming in, voices echoing as though we are in a long, hollow tunnel, I notice these words written on the wall in front of us. Do what you love, painted in a beautiful font. And I wonder, is it meant to be ironic? But this place doesn't seem to be one that would go in for irony. So this is baffling. That it is placed here confirms the ubiquitous nature of the idea. Inexplicably, this encouragement to do what we love seems to be everywhere, like CVS stores. Do what you love. In 2005, Steve Jobs, one of the founders of Apple, gave a commencement speech that is often quoted. Here's the most often quoted part. Jobs said, you've got to find what you love. And that is as true for your work as it is for your lovers. 
Your work is going to fill a large part of your life, and the only way to be truly satisfied is to do what you believe is great work. And the only way to do great work is to love what you do, he said. And what he said apparently played well at Stanford University in 2005, but increasingly, these 15 years, one great recession later, and now in the midst of a pandemic and economic meltdown, increasingly, do what you love seems even more elitist than it would have sounded to, say, someone like me, even in 2005. Someone like me, fortunate me, with work that I do, in fact, love. Work that I understand as a calling, in fact. So you'd think Job's point would resonate, but here's why it doesn't. Someone like me, me, exactly me, had a grandmother who began working in sweatshops at the age of 12 to help support her parents and sisters. My father's mother was a homemaker and with my grandfather raised seven children. My grandfather was a janitor and sometimes Mason. My mother's father was a butcher. So someone like me is two generations away from solidly working class and here's do what you love through the filter of the seamstress the homemaker, the janitor, the butcher, who all dwell in my DNA. I don't know that my grandparents loved what they did. I do know that they took pride in what they did. As the poet describes, the work they did was the kind of work you work hard at, not because you love it, but because you have to. And for some of us, and for some people, you want to do it well. So let's dig a little deeper and ponder what exactly it is about that Steve Jobs oft quote idea that rubs the fur the wrong way. As it turns out, there's no shortage of opinions out there. To start, one writer points out that Jobs uses the word you and your eight times in four sentences. It's an inwardly focused piece of encouragement. The writer Mia Tukumitsu says the following. By portraying Apple as a labor of his individual love, Jobs elided the labor of untold thousands in Apple's factories, hidden from sight on the other side of the planet, the very labor that allowed Jobs to actualize his love. This erasure needs to be exposed, she says. While do what you love seems harmless and precious, it is self-focused to the point of narcissism. Well, them fight in words, and she's on to something. We none of us are self-made, and do what you love upholds the myth that we are. The myth of the self-made individual who through their hard work alone make it on their own, somehow without the support and labor of others. In Steve Jobs' case, the labor of, as the writer said, untold thousands in Apple's factories, hidden from sight on the other side of the planet, the very labor that allowed Jobs to actualize his love. But oh, how we do love the self-made man story. And then there's the poet who observes that Americans are a little in love with work. Some Americans are a little in love with work. It's a class thing. By and large, and I'm painting in broad strokes here, by and large, educated, relatively well-off people are a little in love with work, are more likely to search for a hook into somebody they're meeting for the first time, for example, through what this person does for work. Like this, maybe you meet someone new and right away, one of the first questions you ask is, say it with me, so what do you do? 
maybe what they do doesn't have a lot or anything to do with what they love. Maybe a better hook might be found in a different question. Maybe instead of what do you do, we might appropriate do what you love and ask, so what do you love to do? Maybe we'd find a person who ignored the advice or couldn't follow the advice to do what they love. That was actually the title of an article that was particularly on point, I thought. Interestingly enough, the article appeared in Forbes magazine titled, Five Reasons to Ignore the Advice to Do What You Love. It's by a man named Rob Asgar. The third reason especially grabbed me, not least because the writer quotes Thomas Merton, the revered Trappist monk. So this is it, number three. The search for one's passion can be a distraction from living in the present. The writer explains, 50 years before Steve Jobs told college graduates to ceaselessly search for the true passion, the great Trappist monk Thomas Merton observed, this is Merton's words, the world is full of unsuccessful businessmen who still secretly believe they were meant to be artists or writers or actors in the movies. Merton extorted others instead to find meaning in an imperfect present moment. Who is willing to be satisfied with a job that expresses all his limitations? Merton asked. He will accept such work only as a means of livelihood while he waits to discover his true vacation. Or as the poet said at the start, I feel as though I have two jobs the one that feeds my bank account, and the one that feeds all those intangible parts of me. Like so many people, especially so many people living in a shaky economy, the poet makes a living and then makes time for the work that she loves, writing poetry. She is living in the present. She is living honestly in her reality. There's no failure in that. She's doing what she loves, and she's supporting herself, making a living. So on the inside, one can see out. But those on the outside cannot wholly see into our hearts and minds through the lens of the work that we do. Even if we're lucky enough to have made, in the words of the poet Robert Frost, a vocation and vocation one in sight. Our work is still not the whole of us. Labor Day is the day set aside to honor workers, all workers. All labor has dignity, says Reverend Dr. King. And so we honor the workers whose lives are reflected in what they love and their pride reflected in what they do. Amen. And blessed be. Amen. There is a great old tiny union song that some of you may know. It is entitled, Which Side Are You On? It has a great backstory. And Jeff Kaufman will share the backstory and the song with us. Jeff. Certainly one of the most iconic, beloved, and reused anthems of the American labor movement has been Which Side Are You On? It was written in 1931 by Florence Reese in Harlan County, Kentucky, during a prolonged and violent struggle between the United Mine Workers and the mine owners called the Harlan County War. One night during that struggle, Sheriff J.H. Blair and his men showed up at the Reese homestead looking for Jim, her husband, who was the union leader. Word had gotten to them, so Jim was safely away. 
But Blair and his posse first fired upon the house and then entered it, ransacking it and terrifying Florence and her six children. When they had finally left, Florence tore the back off a calendar hanging in her kitchen and wrote down the words, to which side are you on? And 40 years later, she was singing it again in support of another strike in Harlan County. Many others have sung this song, sometimes changing the lyrics a bit, but also leaving out a couple of verses that I find are important. So I'd like to sing it now as I think Florence might have sung it that night, in fear and anger, a cappella, and with her original lyrics. Which side are you on? Which side are you on? Which side are you on? Oh, which side are you on? Come all you good workers, good news I have to tell of how the good old union has come in here to dwell. Which side are you on? 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 We started this good battle, we know we're sure to win, because we've got the gun thugs looking very thin. Which side are you on? Which side are you on? Which side are you on? Oh, which side are you on? Go to Harlan County, there is no neutral there. You'll either be a union man or a thug for J.H. Blair. Which side are you on? Which side are you on? Which side are you on? Oh, which side are you on? They say they have to guard us to educate their child. Their children live in luxury, our children almost wild. Which side are you on? Which side are you on? Which side are you on? Oh, which side are you on? My daddy was a miner, now he's in the air and sun. He'll be with you fellow workers till every battle's won. Which side are you on? Which side are you on? Which side are you on? Tell me which side are you on? Which side are you on? Which side are you on? Jeff, thank you so much. It is always such a, a joy and so uplifting and meaningful to hear your beautiful voice. And we are so grateful for your contribution of storytelling and the song itself this morning. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Anne. We now enter into our offering for the life and work of this congregation. This is a time of increasing financial hardship for many. We invite you to give in whatever amount makes sense for you in this moment. We are grateful for your support. Contributions are welcome through Venmo or PayPal or by check or online banking. Now let us prepare for giving as we do each week by saying these words together. We give to the work of all souls. Our work weaves the fabric of love called community. To this end, we dedicate ourselves and this our offering. The offering will be gratefully received.
for all that you have given and all that you have sacrificed. We thank you. Each week we pause and pay attention to the joys and sorrows that each of us brings with us into this moment. If you have a specific joy or sorrow that you would like to share, I invite you to type it into the chat now, where it will be seen, witnessed, and held by this caring community. And in this moment of quiet sharing, we enter into a collective silence as we light our candles of intention. Amen. In addition to the joys and sorrows that have been entered into the chat, we received two requests for prayers and healing thoughts this week. Carol is asking for healing thoughts this Friday as she undergoes knee repair surgery. Carol, we're with you. And Mary Lou requests prayers and healing thoughts for her daughter Cecile and her grandchildren who lost their home in the Santa Cruz fires of California. She also shares gratitude for their safety and health and resilience. Mary Lou, we hold your family in our hearts. If you would like your joy or sorrow spoken aloud at a future service, please send an email to belovedcommunity at allsouls.net by 2 p.m. on Thursday. Now let us take a moment to, to just be present to all that has been shared out loud or in the chat and all that is held silently in our hearts. Spirit of life and love and hope, we gather these joys and sorrows. We hold them close with one another and with something larger than ourselves. For we are in the middle of so much that is too big for any one of us. Spirit of life and love and hope, we pray for those whose work is stressful, perhaps tenuous, for those seeking work, those returning to school one way or another, for those engaged in the exhausting work of building a more just world those who are ill or grieving, alone or frightened, those affected by fires and storms. We pray for all who are struggling to do the impossible, which is many of us these days. We pray for this country. with gratitude for the love that holds all, 
and for this community of caring souls. May our own struggles open us up to the struggles of others, that we may be gentle and forgiving with ourselves and one another. Let us remember our blessings and our promise. As we pursue the world of peace and justice that is our vision, may we also find rest and joy and courage for the journey. Amen. Oh, and I needed that prayer. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. So we every year sing the great, the great hymn and marching song, Bread and Roses, named in the Unitarian Universalist hymnal as, as We Come Marching, Marching. Its origin story comes out of a strike of workers and textile factories in Massachusetts. And we sing it holding in our hearts that, that history and that legacy. I will, some of you know this, but I will tell you that I, I sang this song at my grandmother's funeral. She was a proud member of the International Ladies Garment Workers Union. And so uh, I hold her close when we sing this every year. So hold close yourselves, your loved ones, all of those who do the work that in the poet's words is as common as mud. The work of the world is as common as mud. And let us sing robustly with Tanya from wherever you are, bread and roses. Let us sing. As we come marching, marching in the beauty of the dark, on billion dark and kitchen, a thousand workshops crack, or touched with all the radiance that a sudden sun discloses for the people here us singing bread and roses, bread and roses. As we come marching, marching, unnumbered woman dead, go crying through our singing, their ancient song of bread. Small art and love and beauty, their drudging spirits new. Yes, it is bread we fight for, but we fight for roses too. As we come marching, marching, we bring the greater days. The rising of the women means the rising of the race. No more the drudge and idler turn the toe But a sharing of life's glories, bread and roses, bread and roses. Thank you, Tanya, for leading us in that wonderful hymn. We now extinguish our chalice with these words. Our service has ended, but our work is not yet done. May our spirits be renewed and our purpose resolved as we meet the challenges of the week. Our chalice flame is extinguished until once again ignited by the strength of our communion. I invite you as we have been doing as we are at home, to hold your hearts and reach your hand out 
to the folks who you know are there still. Let us go into this Labor Day in this time of very complicated, difficult, difficult struggle for so many as our lives and hearts relate to work. Let us hold close Anne's prayer and hold close each other as we go forward into our days. Be a gift to those whose path you cross. Go in peace and return again with great joy. Amen. Amen. Bill has a wonderful postlude for us. I hope you'll hold on and enjoy that. And before you do, before we let you go into the music, I want to share with, with you uh, one announcement, and that is that we are having a drive-through water communion and pies for peace next Saturday here at 19 J Street from 10 to 11 o'clock, as we did for the flower communion. Try to uh, space yourselves out in that hour. You will be greeted by the staff and by your board of trustees. You are invited to bring your water with you as you would do normally. Um, your water will be joined with other water. The Good Neighbor Offering Beneficiary is Writer's Block, Inc., an excellent youth-led organization out of New London, but serving the whole region. Check the e-blast for more details. We're really looking forward to seeing you. The service next Sunday, remember that Saturday, the service next Sunday is as usual at 10 o'clock, and we look forward to seeing you then. Go in peace, everyone. Bye. Thank you, Ian and Jesse. <laughs>